Yeah, Someone very proudly shouted Waterloo yesterday. <laughs> Anyone here from France? Anyone? French? Good. <laughs> <laughs> William was crowned King William I on Christmas Day of that year, but he had to continue to fight his Saxon subjects who did not take kindly to Norman domination. William was looking for someone to build a citadel to impress and dominate the citizens of London, and he chose a site just inside the eastern city walls where once a Roman fort had stood. In 1078, he authorised the building of his first royal palace and fortress in this country. Today, we refer to it as the White Tower, and it's over there behind those buildings. So don't bother looking, it's behind the building. <laughs> <laughs> over the next 200 years, successive monarchs continued to add to the tower's defences. The inner bailiwick or defensive wall, containing 13 smaller towers, was constructed in around 1220. The outer wall was completed in 1280 and was created as a further barrier against attack. Now another part of the tower's defence was this moat. This was dug during the reign of King Edward I and was once filled with water and it was considerably deeper than it is today. And it was designed to make use of the tidal flow of the River Thames. For twice a day at high tide, the river would flow in and around the moat and flush it clean. Does that sound like a good idea? It didn't work. <laughs> Over time, all the rubbish, <coughs> raw human sewage, that's poo. <laughs> dead animals, dead tourists, <laughs> flow downstream into our moat and sink to the bottom. And over time, we successfully created the largest cesspit in Europe. This situation continued for a period of 500 years. Imagine what it must have smelt like on a warm summer's day. Best line of defence we ever had. <laughs> In 1843, it got so bad they filled it up with sand and shingle to the level you see it now. As I said earlier, this was the first royal palace and fortress of its kind to be built by the Normans in this country. But over the years, it's been employed in many other ways. For example, this is still the place where we keep safe the crown jewels and royal regalia and has been since 1303. This was the location of the Royal Mint, where all the coins of the British Empire were designed and produced until 1810. The British Empire. <laughs> right, if you come from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, Zimbabwe, quite a lot of Africa, the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, quite a lot of Asia, some parts of China, the Caribbean and lots of other islands dotted around the world, including the United Kingdom and ERA, then at some point or other you have been part of the British Empire. And therefore I'd like you to join me in an enthusiastic and rousing huzzah. Something like this. British Empire, huzzah! So let's have a go. British Empire, huzzah! Pretty good, I'm mildly impressed. Now, let's hear the Americans have a go. Huzzah! Rubbish. <laughs> and by the way, you don't get to say huzzah. You made your choice. <laughs> However, as we're getting on quite well recently, I'm willing to give you a yee-haw. You can have a yee-haw, right? So, so let's do this get together. Uh, all those of you who are not an American, British Empire! Huzzah! Americans! Yeehaw! There you go. That's why you'll never have an empire. <laughs> we used to have a prison here, a state prison, one of the most notorious prisons in history. There's the bars to prove it. Anyone here from Australia? Yes. Welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> this is a place of murder, a place of torture, and a place of executions. Now, Talking of executions, please look over there. But there you can see a large, prominent grey building with ornate statues. That has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the Tower of London. But it does serve as a useful landmark. So let me tell you about a place below and to the right. If you go up there, you'll find a garden. And in the garden, there's a large plate on the floor. And the plate tells you that that was the old permanent execution site. Now, many people died up there between the 14th and 18th century. Some of them were burnt to death, some were hanged, and 75 men of noble birth were to lose their heads up there by means of block and axe. So just for a moment, let's pause and imagine the scene up there on the day of an execution. Thousands of bloodthirsty, unwashed, stinking peasants from Edmonton <laughs> <laughs> would have gathered up there for a day of fun and festivities. Yes, fun. They'd have brought the children, grandma and a picnic basket, and they'd be watching the fire eaters, the jugglers, the dancing bears and the men on stilts. Everyone was having a super time, except for one. <laughs> <laughs> Condemned now would have been let out of one of our buildings. He'd be wearing his finest clothes, 
He'd be dragged along here and up the hill to booing and jeering crowds and people, pelting with fruit and vegetables. When he gets to the top, he's got to climb the big wooden steps. At the top of those wooden steps, he's met by a giant of a man dressed all in black leather. Calm down, madam. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> He'd deliver a fine speech, say his prayers, and place himself down with his neck resting on a block of oak. He'd give a word or a signal. The executioner'd bend down, pick up his heavy, clumsy axe, and bring it crashing down through that poor, unfortunate soul's neck. There'd be an ooh from the crowd. Ooh. There'd be a gush of blood. <laughs> the executioner bend down, pick up the severed and still bleeding head by the hair, hold it aloft for all to see, and loudly proclaim, Behold the head of a traitor, so die all traitors, God save the king! And the crowd would go wild and cheer. <laughs> and the crowd would go wild and cheer! <laughs> Buy a ticket! <laughs> carried from the streets of London to London Bridge, which in those days was the only bridge across the River Thames. The head would then be left displayed upon the gateway entrance, a sign of the fate that would await all would be traitors. Meanwhile, the head of the course would be taken down, placed into a small hand cart, and brought back into the tower. It would trundle through the archways and up to the Chapel Royal, where it would be quickly buried inside the chapel in an unmarked grave. We're going to follow the route of that blood-soaked cart. We're going to walk in the footsteps of some people who've changed the world. People like King Henry VIII, People like Queen Amberlynn, people like Sir Walter Raleigh. Are you ready to embark on a gruesome, gory journey of over 900 years? Yes! yes! Cool, let's go! <laughs> <laughs>